Hello my soul family, welcome to the School of Light and to the Spiritual Book Club this winter season. My name is Christy Ramirez and I am your soul coach, spiritual influencer, spiritual teacher here at the School of Light and also a motivational speaker. So today we are here gathered for continuing with chapter two of A Course in Miracles. This is such a powerful book. I absolutely love it. Just a reminder on what we touched up on class one, which was the introduction of miracles is take as much notes as you would like throughout the book. If you have the book with you and are reading along with me, it's so useful to underline and write notes within the book itself. As you can see, I've read this book three times and I've already bookmarked several areas. I've already, you know, underlined and wrote notes throughout the book. So as I'm teaching this for this, uh, fourth time you can say and final time I have so much more to offer because of the notes that are already here from previous readings so let's continue and before this of course I am actually um, going to be sipping my coffee throughout make sure that you have a nice cup of coffee with you throughout our session which is about an hour max 90 minutes if it's like a, a lengthy chapter but other than that this is about getting through and really going deep into the messages, applying it into our daily life, and letting it transform us. Nice and warm, just freshly made. All right, let's get started right away with chapter two. The illusion of separation. Now this separation that we're talking about is the separation between us and God and between our self and our inner higher self. This section deals with a fundamental misuse of knowledge, referred to in the Bible as the cause of the fall or separation. Why people fall off the path, right? This is also in relation to the term fallen angels, angels on this planet, right? There are some definitions which I asked you to take from the dictionary, which will be helpful here. They are somewhat unusual since they are not the first definitions which are given. Nevertheless, the fact that each of them does appear in the dictionary should be reassuring. So this is the term definition of project as a verb is to extend forward or out and then project as a noun, a plan in the mind. And then the word world, a natural grand division. So we will refer later to projection as related to both mental health and mental illness. We have already absorbed, observed that man can create an empty shell, but he cannot create nothing at all. So this emptiness provides the screen for the misuse of projection. The Garden of Eden, which is described as a literal garden in the Bible, was not an actual garden at all. It was merely a mental state of complete need lack. And even in the literal account, it is noteworthy that the pre-separation state was essentially one in which man needed nothing. So the tree of knowledge is also an overly literal figure. These concepts need to be clarified before the real meaning of the separation or the detour into fear that can be fully understood. So to project as defined above is a fundamental attribute of God which he gave to his son. So Jesus was a projection of God. He was a direct example of God, right? That's how he wanted to portray this. So in the creation, God projected his creative ability from himself to the souls that he created and he also imbued them with the same loving will to create. The soul has not only been fully created, but has also been created perfect. So there is no emptiness in it. Because of its likeness to its creator, it is creative, right? No child of God can lose this ability because it is inherent in what he is, but he can also use it inappropriately. So whenever projection is used inappropriately, it always implies that some emptiness or lack exists, 
and that it is in man's ability to put his own ideas there instead of truth. So if you consider carefully what this entails, the following will become quite apparent. First, the assumption is implicit that what God created can be changed by the mind of man. Second, the concept that what is perfect can be rendered imperfect or wanting is accepted. Third, the belief that man can distort the creations of God, including himself, is accepted. Fourth, the idea that since man can create himself, the direction of his own creation is up to him is implied. So these related distortions represent a picture of what actually occurred in the separation. None of this existed before, nor does it actually exist now. The world was made as a natural grand division or a projecting outward of God. So naturally, the world is already separated, is what it's saying. And I feel like it's between obviously God and what's not godly, right? That is why everything that he created is like him. Projection as undertaken by God is very similar to the kind of inner radiance which the children of the Father inherit from him. So it is important to know that the term project outward necessarily implies that the real source of projection is internal in the mind and through the Holy Spirit is what I wrote in my note here. So this is as true of the Son as of the Father. So the world in the original connotation of the term included both the proper creation of man by God and the proper creation by man in his right mind. The latter required the endowment of man by God with free will because all loving creation is freely given. So nothing in these statements implies any sort of level involvement or in fact anything except one continuous line of creation in which all aspects are of the same order. So when the lies of the serpent were introduced, which is like the deception that Eve fell for, they were specifically called lies because they are not true, right? So if something's not true, it's just a lie, right? It's false. And when man listened, all he heard was untruth. He does not have to continue to believe what is not true unless he chooses to do so. And all of his miscreations can literally disappear in the twinkling of an eye because they are merely visual misperceptions. So man's spiritual eye can sleep but a sleeping eye can still see. And I think that's so interesting. I, I'm going to underline this. Your subconscious will still feel, basically. So what is seen in dreams seems to be very real. And the Bible mentions that a deep sleep fell upon Adam, and nowhere is there any reference to his waking up. Now, this deep, deep sleep can also be metaphoric, to falling asleep to your consciousness, and then not thinking clearly, and not seeing through your spiritual eye. And that's where people fall. That's where people sin because they're vulnerable, right? So the history of man in the world as he sees it has not yet been marked by any genuine or comprehensive reawakening or rebirth. So this is impossible as long as man projects in the spirit of miscreation. It still remains within him. However, To project as God projected his own spirit to him. So in reality, this is his only choice because his free will was given him for his own joy in creating the perfect. All fear is ultimately reducible to the basic misperception that man has the ability to usurp the power of God. Right? We can't over-trump the power of God ever, right? It can only be emphasized that he neither can nor has been able to do this. In this fact lies the real ju justification for his escape from fear. And the escape is brought about by his acceptance of the atonement, which places him in a position to realize that his own errors never really occurred. And when the deep sleep fell upon Adam, he was in a condition to experience nightmares because he was asleep. So if a light is suddenly turned on while someone is dreaming a fearful dream, he may initially interpret the light itself as a part of his own dream and be afraid of it. However, when he awakens, the light is correctly perceived as the release from that dream, which is no longer a courted reality. It is quite apparent that this release does not depend on the kind of knowledge 
which is nothing more than deceiving lies. The knowledge which illuminates rather than obscures is the knowledge which not only sets you free, but which also shows you clearly that you are already free. And this is the term spiritual liberation, right? So the knowledge which illuminates rather than obscures is the knowledge that not only sets you free, but shows you that you are already free. And I'm going to write spiritual liberation. <laughs> So whatever lies that you may believe are of no concern to the miracle, which can heal any of them with equal ease, it makes no distinctions among misperceptions. Its sole concern is to distinguish between truth on the one hand and all kinds of errors on the other, right? Because there's only truth or non-truth, right? There's like no in-between. Some miracles may seem to be of a greater magnitude than others, but remember the first point in this course is that there is no order of difficulty in miracles. So it doesn't matter how big or small the miracle you want to manifest, it still requires this high vibrational frequency. Living through your higher self and only in love. So in reality, you are perfectly unaffected by all expressions of lack of love. These can be neither these can be either from yourself and others, or from yourself to others, or from others to you. Peace is an attribute in you. You cannot find it outside, and all mental illness is some form of external searching. So the peace is already within you. Mental health is also inner peace. It enables you to remain unshaken by any lack of love from without and capable through your own miracles of correcting the external conditions which proceed from lack of love in others. And now we move on to section two, which is the reinterpretation of defenses. When you are afraid of anything, you are acknowledging its power to hurt you, right? Fear brings vulnerability, and that makes you more vulnerable to then getting hurt, right? So remember that where your heart is, there is your treasure also. This means that you believe in what you value. So if you are afraid, you are valuing wrongly, right? You're in the wrong, in the dark. So human understanding will inevitably value wrongly and by endowing all human thoughts with equal power will inevitably destroy peace right because if you're in fear you're not in peace it's impossible to be in peace at the same time and that is why the bible speaks of the peace of god which passeth human understanding you can have peace even amidst struggle turmoil chaos right? But it's choosing this peace. That is the first step. This peace is totally incapable of being shaken by human errors of any kind. It denies the ability of anything which is not of God to affect you in any way. You are basically untouchable by fear. And this is the proper use of denial. It's not used to hide anything but to correct error. It brings all error into the light and since error and darkness are the same, it corrects error automatically. So true denial is a powerful protective device. You can and should deny any belief that error can hurt you. And this kind of denial is not a concealment device, but a correction device, right? It's not about running away and being in denial, but it's correcting the falsity and living through your higher self and then believing in the opposite, which is love. The right mind of the mentally healthy depends on it. You can do anything that I ask and I have asked you to perform miracles and have made it clear that miracles are natural, corrective, healing, and universal. It can be performed by anybody. Or should I say it can happen to anybody. 
There's nothing good they cannot do, but they cannot be performed in the spirit of doubt. If there's any speck of doubt or fear in what you're trying to manifest in your outcome, then that will taint the miracle process. God, and you need to remember that this miracle process is like a whole bunch of little stars in the air, frequency-wise, that only your spiritual eye can see. And if there's any speck of darkness, which is the doubt, the fears, the insecurities that come up, that will taint and blur these little stars that are trying to work its miracle. So God and the souls He created are completely dependent on each other. The creation of the soul has already been perfectly accomplished, but the creation by soul has not. God created souls so that He could depend on them because He created them perfectly. He gave them this peace so that they cannot be shaken and would be unable to be deceived. And whenever you are afraid, you are deceived. Your mind is not serving the soul. This literally starves the soul by denying its daily bread. God offers only mercy, and your words should reflect only mercy because that is what you have received, and that is what you should give. Justice is a temporary expedient or an attempt to teach man the meaning of mercy, and I underline that. That's a very important sentence right there. Because justice balances anything out in your life that is unfair, right? It's God's offer of mercy. Its judgmental side arises only because man is capable of injustice, and that is what his mind creates. God can only create justice, right? Yet humans, not so much, right? You are afraid of God's will because you have used your own will, which he created in the likeness of his own, to miscreate. And what you do not realize is that the mind can miscreate only when it is not free. An imprisoned mind is not free by definition. It is possessed or held back by itself. Its will is therefore limited and is not free to assert itself. The real meaning of are of one kind which was mentioned before, is are of one mind or will. And when the will of the Sonship, which is Christ, and the Father are one, their perfect accord is heaven. And I also underline that sentence. So any denial of error is a powerful defense of truth. You will note that we have been shifting the emphasis from the negative to the positive use of denial. And as we have already stated, denial is not a purely negative device. It results in positive miscreation. And that is the way that the mentally ill do employ it. But remember, a very early thought of your own. Never underestimate the power of denial. In the service of the right mind, the denial of error frees the mind and reestablishes the freedom of the will. And when the will is really free, it cannot miscreate because it recognizes only truth. So false projection arises out of false denial, not out of its proper use. My own role in the atonement is one of true projection. I can project to you the affirmation of truth, and if you project error to me or to yourself, you're interfering with the process. So my use of projection, which can also be yours, is not based on faulty denial. It does involve, however, the very powerful use of the denial of errors. The miracle worker is one who accepts my kind of denial and projection, unites his own inherent abilities to deny and project with mine, and imposes them back on himself and others. This establishes the total lack of threat anywhere, and together we can then work for the real time of peace, which is eternal. The improper use of defenses is quite widely recognized, but their proper use has not been sufficiently understood as yet. They can indeed create man's perception both of himself and of the world, and they can distort or correct depending on what you use them for. Denial should be directed only to error, and projection should be reserved only for truth. Right? You only want to project to others truth, not anything that is inner self, fears, or hurts from the past. You don't want to project traumas onto others ever, right? only love, only truth. You should truly give as you have truly received, and the golden rule can work effectively only on this basis, right? That's basically what the golden rule states. Intellectualization is a term which stems from the mind-brain confusion.
delusion. Right-mindedness is the device which defends the right mind and gives it control over the body. Intellectualization implies a split, while right-mindedness involves healing. Right, Because when you're too much in the intellectual, you're only in one side of the brain, which I believe is the right side of the brain, and the left side of the brain, which is the more intuitive side, is discarded, right? As false, as pseudoscience even. But it's this, uh, or should I say that's the left side, right? It's the right-mindedness that involves healing, which is the intuitive side of us, right? So we need both sides, not just one of the brain. Withdrawal is properly employed in the service of withdrawing from the meaningless. It is not a device for escape before consolidation. There is only one mind, right? As we unite both sides of our brain, it's the intellectual with the spiritual, with the intuitive. Dissociation is quite similar. You should split off or dissociate yourself from error, but only in defense of integration. Detachment is essentially a weaker form of dissociation. Flight can be undertaken in whatever direction you choose, but note that the concept itself implies flight from something. Flight from error is perfectly appropriate. Distanciation can be properly used as a way of putting distance between yourself and what you should fly from. And regression is an effort to return to your own original state. It can thus be utilized to restore rather than to go back to the less mature. Sublimation should be a redirection of effort to the sublime. There are many other so-called dynamic concepts which are profound errors due essentially to the misuse of defenses. Among them is the concept of different levels of aspiration, which actually result from level confusion. However, the main point to be understood from this section is that you can defend spiritual truth as well as error, which is anything of illusion, fear, or ego, and in fact, much better. And this truth also is guided by your higher self, which is guided through love, right?